I guess the Cuttery's royal family just really likes cycling and they wanted to have a race there and it's important for us because it's, it's the first race of the year that ASO puts on. ASO is the company that runs the Tour de France. It is complicated getting an invitation to the Tour de France. There's a lot of factors. Um, there's no definitive empirical way to do it. You're invited, like you're invited to, the, to a party at the White House. How does your wife like you being on the road all the time? She's used to it? She does, it doesn't bother her. You've been together for a while? Ten years, yes, yeah. How many kids do you have? Two. So they're used to it too, huh? Mm -hmm. The older one, we got a little calendar for her <laughs> on the wall. That's cool. And um, basically she crosses out every day. <laughs> so she can see how, you know, how far to go before I, I get back home. <laughs> I'm uh, Magnus Baxter. I've been a professional for 12 years, starting my 13th year. Can you tell me a little about your jersey? Um, it's the uh, Swedish national champion jersey, uh, which I got in uh, June last year for the first time after 13 years of trying. So uh, I'm pretty proud of this one. I won the stage in the Tour de France back in 98. I won the Paris Roubaix in 2004. Those are probably the two big ones that I sort of tend to hold on quite dearly to. Magnus is, uh, he's kind of a big teddy bear. He's the largest rider in the peloton, but he acts like he's about that big sometimes. Like, he's just very soft-spoken and nice. Magnus is someone who certainly, towards the end of his career, he's an older athlete, but um, he's, you know, he's very experienced. I haven't really set a date as to when, when I'm gonna pack up my bike, you know. It's kind of one of them things that I think I'll, I'll find out myself when I reach that point when I can't, when I'm not enjoying going out training every day and going to the races anymore, then it's time to pack up. Welcome to the seventh edition of the Tour of Qatar. Looking forward to it. It's going to be a bit chaotic in the beginning with the wind, crosswind coming up and everything. So, you know, keep an eye open and, you know, put on your safety belt. Seventy kilometers an hour as Big Magnus Backstead, the Swedish national champion, rolls through. Coming into one kilometer to go on the left-hand side, it looks as if the Slipstream team are starting to make the move around the outside. And now the Swedish national champion and Magnus Backstead is poised and waiting to make his move. He's starting to wind it up around the outside. Sutton is the man in the blue jersey. Van Uberman in silver and two of Magnus Backstead's gone down. And Sutton has gone over the top of him. There's mayhem at the front. Magnus Backstead has left strawn across the tarmac here in Qatar. Maybe his hopes for another victory at Paris-Roubaix are dashed within a couple of months of the season getting underway. Julian Dean also, it looks like his bike is far worse for wear than what he is. Chris Sutton is limping in across the line. Let's hope that his collarbone's not broken because that does not look good. What happened is Maggie's got his head down and one of the quick set guys pulls off in front of him and Maggie's bumped into him. And all our guys go on top, just an accident. Is Magnus okay? I think he's broken his collarbone. So no, he's not okay. Uh, a cycling crash is over 40 miles an hour, going all the way up to almost 70 miles an hour. Uh, they're not fun. I mean, you just you just don't have any protective gear. I mean, a little styrofoam lid on your head. I mean, okay, that prevents you from dying, maybe. Just imagine that you're in your car and you decide to strip down to your underwear and you're driving out on the highway and you open the door and you jump out of the car. I mean, that's pretty much what it is. He's you, big fella. Fuck me, I'm coming quickly there. Oh, no, it's just a crash. Oh, oh, oh he's down! down. <laughs> Let's see that again. <laughs> And they show this bit afterwards where they pick up this, your bike on the floor, and then you just see you kind of, because it's focusing on the bike, you see you come, pick it up, 
So you're like standing there, and the handlebars yeah. are just fucking all twisted, and you just stand there and you look at it. <laughs> and you just fucking do this, and you just turn around. <laughs> and just, just stand there. It's like... <laughs> I, I actually, I actually <laughs> they, they do actually say that you're never not a proper bike rider until you've broken your collarbone at least once. And how many times have you broken yours? I think this is the fourth, fourth time. So... You know, I'm a, I'm a proper bike rider. <laughs> I've done, I've done, I've done my, my fair share. Thanks. How are you, boy? Make me proud tomorrow. I'll be watching on the like television. Yeah, yeah thanks. Good luck with cover. Yeah, I'll be back, man. Don't worry. Although we didn't win the race, it was a win for us because our first impression was a great one. It probably added a little bit of an element of, wow, they can still perform even when, even when someone crashes, they can still do well. It sucks that we're here, you know? We're here because we're be testing Barry. Barry. Right, and freaking Kobe Bryant and LeBron James and all those freaking assholes. So I want to know how much they test them. Yeah, they go to Kobe's house three times in a month. No, nope. they're like once a year. You know, we, we test a lot. We test more frequently than I think uh, any other team out there. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We have a zero tolerance program, and if one guy on our team goes positive, then 100 people in this organization lose their jobs and go packing. Third party drug testing is very important because it's not just a case of the management saying, right, sign this piece of paper and promise not to dope, which a lot of teams do in the past and have done. What we're saying is we don't want you to dope. And we're gonna have we're gonna invest money into preventing you from even having any temptation. She relates mainly for crashing. A lot of people think it's for aerodynamics, but uh, when you have the bandage on you can take the bandage off without having too much pain. I guess it's got some kind of aerodynamic purpose as well, but... We don't live the average lifestyle, you know? 2006, I was on the road for 320 days. This year, I'll be on the road quite a bit more. But, you know, you're only young once, you know? This is the only time I have my life to do this. It's the only time I have to go to the Olympics. It's the only time I have to live my dream. So I'm, I'm excited and scared. <laughs> Mike's had some brilliant moments, and he's had some kind of crappy moments early on in his career. I think sometimes he builds things up so big in his head, and he, he tries to figure them out. But when he just lets it sort of go, you know, on his own, and doesn't try to over-cerebralize it, then he can win. I'm going to put this on the back of my saddle so I can be identified from the other riders from behind. This is all they're going to see. <laughs> you know, this is vacation for me. Last time I saw him race on the track in Dallas, he won the points race down there. That was two years ago. Where did you get on? That's what I'm really hoping for for tonight. It's cool, Dad. Modesty is a virtue. Modesty is a virtue. I enjoy having him around because he hasn't seen me race uh, at this level in a long time. It seems like I never, ever do well in front of him, though. It just seems like I have this, like, curse. <laughs> and I know that it's not true. It's just I just never have a decent ride in front of him, so he's never actually seen me really win a big race, and that hurts. All right, big guy, um, well, I'll see you at the track then, huh? I'm gonna get my laundry together here and my bag together and... All right, if there's anything I can and... do to assist you, let me know. I, I mean, I know you do There's like 900 all... people here to assist me. <laughs> I, can, I, can, so? I can wipe my own ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last year at this time, I was in attendance, but I wasn't racing. I was super depressed and not able to race. That was when I had my pulmonary embolism, um, blood clot in my lung, and uh, I couldn't race for six months. But a year later, here I am at the World Cup and I'm racing. So um, I'm excited, stoked to be here and ready to race. I was scared. One of the worst fears I've ever had in my life. Um, no parent ever, and my parents told me this today, and they were just about in their 80s. Um, no parent wants to bury their child. I was on a date, I was laying in our bed watching movie Cars, and uh, 
I just started having these crazy spasms in my back. Like, I felt like I was getting shot by a gun or someone just it stuck a knife in my, my chest and was just turning, turning it, you know? Yeah, I thought for sure I was having a heart attack. What else would it be, you know? Who knew it would be a blood clot in my lung? Six months, I couldn't really train normally. It couldn't go too hard because you never know if you're gonna bleed out internally. I couldn't crash, so I had to train with a big orange flag on my bike so that cars could see me. So it's been a pretty long road coming back, a really long road. My focus this year is to participate at the Olympic Games. You know, not to race the Tour de France, but to actually pursue the track and go to the Olympic Games. Track racing is a really important effort for us because of the Olympics. I think it's an opportunity for us to reach fans and also to reach prospective sponsors that otherwise we wouldn't have had access to. So today at the Los Angeles World Cup, Mike's going to be competing in what's called the points race. It's a pretty complex race on track cycling. And essentially every five laps, these guys are going to be racing for points. There's a lot of strategy involved. You've got to decide when you want to score your points, when you need to lay back. And it's a pretty exciting and, and intricate race. Even on a night like tonight, which was not one of his better nights, so few people can do what he did tonight, even to finish 15th is tremendous. The cycling team is a, a really complicated organism. We have about 50 employees, and about half of those employees are the athletes. Parallel to that is a whole staff of, of mechanics and, and soigneurs and doctors and race directors. We're on the road 250 days a year, and we race, I think, almost 160 days total for the season. There are a lot of times where there are two or sometimes even three races going on simultaneously. And so we'll have one squad that'll be racing at you know, the, the Tour of Britain, while another squad will be racing in the Tour of Missouri. And so in the end, it's this, this company with all of these different facets to it. OK, it looks good. It was neck and stuff, too, man. He won't let me. Yeah. You got, yeah. you got, like, just get hold this still, out. Hold still, hold still, hold still. My name is Laura Pate. So I'm married to Danny Pate. He's one of the riders on the team. Hold it. I think I can get it. I am the Saunier, um, which is French for something. I think support. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I just get them ready to go on the race, I guess. Like, I'm going to put out chairs and um, bananas and stuff for them to eat and their, their bottles and that sort of thing. I think this year I've been home maybe five weeks total. It seems like it. It could be more like six or seven, but not very much. And maybe only two of those were with Danny. Keys. Perfect. Thanks. So Lara doesn't really fancy being a swanier a whole ton, you know. Actually, she doesn't like it at all. He only does it basically to be able to spend, so we can spend more time together and not be like a long distance relationship, you know. And, it's hard. He's with the guys and I'm doing my work and I don't know, at night we go to the same hotel room, but a lot of times we don't interact a lot during the races, but um, 
like sometimes we'll make a point to go out to dinner together by ourselves or if we can or something like that instead of going to the team dinner because sometimes it just gets like old <laughs> to have other people around us all the time. It is a big misconception that cycling is an individual sport, professional cycling anyway. It's not true. In order to win a race, you need a team around you. To really simplify cycling tactics, the team leader never wants to lead the race until the last possible moment that you can lead the race. If you're sitting on the front, you're wasting a lot more energy than the guy sitting from behind you. So you always want to be behind somebody if you can. And so the way to win the race is having your team leader positioned well, having riders around him protecting him. You know, it's the only sport where an individual wins and takes all the glory because of the work that his teammates gave to him. I just want to welcome everybody, especially these people who are wearing tuxedos yeah. at a bike parade. It's a wonderful day. We probably know everybody here. Most of them I've actually been in rehab with. <laughs> Tour of California, I mean, it's only been around, this is third year. For us as an American team, next to Tour de France, is probably going to be their biggest race of the year. David Miller, you know, he, he's really taken ownership of this team. He really wants to show his new team to be one of the best teams in the world, and he's definitely put a lot of pressure on himself to, you know, to make sure that happens. So are you, are you not allowed to ride the Olympics? Uh, no, not this year. Well, at the moment, what it is, the British Olympic Association, they have a, a bylaw in place which forbids athletes that have been sanctioned for doping from ever doing the Olympics again. Ever? I, okay. No, yeah, ever, yeah. Now, it's a weak bylaw, and I could appeal it. The thing is, if I do it this year now, if I would go up to Beijing, I would get dragged through the mud in the press and in the tabloid press. It would be a big story. And, and to be honest, I can't face it. Moment. Yeah, everything's going yeah. so well with the team, everything's yeah, yeah, going so yeah. well, and I'm like, it means digging up my pass, going back to courts, going doing all this, and, and I have to ask myself, is it that important to me this year? I mean, it's important. I lost everything. Um, I lost all my material possessions, I lost um, my sport. There was a, a doping investigation going on in, into my French team. I was the, the leader of the number one French team at the time, and they decided to arrest me two weeks before the Tour de France. It was a pretty full-on thing. I was sitting in a restaurant with friends and three drug squad from Paris came in and, and took me out and, and uh, took me to my apartment, went in there and gunpoint with guns and stuff. It was ridiculous. It was just farcical. But while they were clearing and stripping out my apartment, they found two empty syringes and then that was it. I was fired from my team within a week, 10 days, and then was put in front of my national governing bodies, disciplinary commission, and they then banned me for two years. I spent about seven months just drunk, so, and just, and I lost everything, all my material life. So it was a kind of, it was a very rapid eight month downward spiral towards hitting rock bottom. I think uh, we've built sports up onto a pedestal that perhaps it, it never belonged to be on. Basically the media and sports writers create almost mythical stories out of sporting events and heroes out of these players, which uh, isn't necessarily true. A lot of the time they're just ordinary people that make ordinary mistakes who just happen to be born with an amazing talent.